Welcome to the Department of Emergency Medicine Grand Rounds for October. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Garth Hunt. And I think most of you know Garth. Um, but um, I th the, the work that Garth is doing is, um, is I, I think, really groundbreaking. It's, and it's not easy work. It's very difficult work. But within our portfolio of innovations in the Department of Emergency Medicine, there's about 12 things we identify as individual innovation initiatives. And they're kind of groupings of things. Um, but within that, there are um, at least three, and Garth's is one of them, that looks beyond individual patient care and how we might better find better of individual patients. It's looking more at the system. And so technically it's health services research, but Garth's work is actually looking um, beyond traditional health services research and actually changing the paradigm and looking almost, uh, and, and as he talks about, almost looking at the department kind of in a similar way that we look at patients and to make sure that the patients within that department are going to get the, the, the optimum care. So he's been working on it for quite a while. He's been doing some fantastic work and, and already piloting some stuff. So I'm pleased to hear an update and hear what's going on. So Garth, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. I am getting my mic on. Can people hear me? Can people in the remote sites hear me? Wave your hand if you can. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Jim, and a very kind introduction, and happy to be here this morning. And some of you will have seen all of this before. Is there an echo? Because I think the lectern mic is on. Let me just get rid of that. Uh, there we go. Is that better? Less of an echo? Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, so this is uh, work that's been going on for quite some time. Some of you have lived through it, so thank you for your uh, long suffering and patience. Uh, and so it's uh, slides that some of you have seen and some of you will not have seen. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time at the meeting and just to orient everybody to what exactly it is we're talking about. And we're going to parse the title. We're going to go through, no, we're not going to go through word by word, but uh, we're going to try to make sense of this word resilience and why we were thinking to engineer it. But let me begin with this, because this is where it all starts and this is where it needs to stay. Healthcare is a dangerous activity. Emergency departments are high hazard units within a high risk system. And we hurt patients. We harm them. They die in our care. And not all of it is related to things that are unpreventable. And this is something we all know. So this is an attempt to try to change that. So engineering, why the word? So most people think of engineering as something you do with trains or car engines or bridges or, well, it's way bigger than that, of course. Uh, it comes from the Latin uh, ingenium or cleverness to contrive, to devise. And I'm going to use the uh, idea of application of practical knowledge to solve problems. So that's the way I'm using the term engineering. So I'm not designing resilience, but I'm engineering or facilitating or cultivating uh, that kind of idea. The resilience word is a little more complicated. Uh, although the dictionary says it dates back to the mid uh, 17th century, it actually goes way back to Seneca the Elder who used the idea of resilience in leaping. Um, and uh, this is where I get to it much more recently. Um, and this is what got me started on this whole concept of resilience. And this quote, some of you have all have seen this before. Uh, it's in the work that I did uh, a few years back, trying to get a sense of how we create safety in a complex environment. And this is the quote. Despite a lot of limitations, we make it happen. It's what we do. I don't think you'd be working in an emergency if you couldn't adapt to that. We're able to step up to the plate, utilize what resources we have, even though some of them are limited, and we're able to think outside of the box. We're flexible and we're adaptable. So in my attempt to make sense of this quote, I came across this body of work called resilience engineering, and I've just flipped the terms. So just a brief history. So the first use of resilience in science comes from this guy, Francis Bacon. And he was using it to describe echoes. So there's the concept of rebounding. That's where the first 
use of it is in science. But then it goes on into material engineering and it describing the resilience of trees and timber. And then into metals, the resilience of metals to make cannons. And this is one of the concepts that has persisted, this concept from materials engineering. So what you have here is a classic stress strain plot. And so in materials engineering, you've got performance on one side uh, and you've got the demand on the other side. So the stress and the strain. And what you can see is that in the first region, the performance and the demand are matching. So we call that the elastic region. Then you get to the region where it decompensates, and that's the so-called plastic region. Just think of it as degraded performance. We see that every day at work. And eventually, in, in uh, materials, you get a fracture point, and it, and it breaks. And that happens in systems as well. So that's where this concept is coming from. This is the guy that's uh, credited with bringing the idea of resilience to systems and e ecological systems. So Buzz was, Holling was actually here at UBC. He did his PhD here and then went down to work at the University of Florida. So he's an ecologist. And this is in the mid-70s. And this is kind of when the concept really started to take off. And these are the two key phrases, adaptation and transformation, that he uh, brought to the literature. And that's how we're going to try to use this. Uh, it's a hyper-popular word right now. And I think it's really important to dissect the use of the word and what it is and the context and meaning that we're using it for. So this is just it. Uh, the use of the word is a topic in the web of science over the last couple of decades. I think the reason why it has happened this way is because we're starting to appreciate this concept of complexity and nonlinearity so that not everything lines up in a nice linear pathway like we often think of. It's, it's not simple. It's uh, uh, unbelievably complex, and I think healthcare can be described like lots of systems within the world as a complex adaptive system. So the character of flocks of birds is a form thereof. And what we know about this is it's dynamic, it's emergent, it's entangled, and it's robust and or resilient. And we're going to tease apart robustness and resilience because they're not the same. The other part that comes to this is what Donald Schoen called a swampy lowlands, and this is a description of work. And we often think of work as quite a codifiable. In other words, we can write policy and procedures that codify what we need to do. And that comes from a somewhat reductionistic idea. Real work, everyday work, work as we do it, is often much messier. It has lots of messy details. And what we codify is an abstraction of real work. And so we need to figure out how to understand the swampy lowlands. And what we've come to understand is that patient safety is a wicked problem. And that is, it's not a problem that lends itself to easy solutions, uh, much like other problems that are intractable in, uh, in the world. So how does this all apply to an emergency department? Well, this is us for the last... Uh, five years, and you can see, and probably true with lots of other departments, we're seeing rising volumes. We're seeing rising acuity and complexity, and we are struggling to find a way to care for them. And we have an innovation called the Rapid Assessment Zone that Lawrence in, uh, put together a few years back, and it's been very helpful to uh, manage flow, but it has its own limits. And I think we're getting close to reaching that. So almost uh, over a third of our patients are seen assessed and discharged through the rapid assessment zone. Uh, why is this a problem and how does it relate to safety? Well, this is the study that Gutman and group did in Ontario, 10 million visits. And this is the best evidence I know of that links safety and operational performance. And what it's showing is that as the mean length of stay during the same shift rises, so this is the collective length of stay, not the individual patient's length of stay. So the collective length of stay, the average length of stay, it's almost like a dose-response relationship. So this is a statistical association. We don't have a causal understanding yet. Uh, as the hours go up, the risk goes up. So this is risk of death, and this is risk of hospital admission at seven days. So operational performance matters, and how we perform matters. So it's really three key ideas. We have choices, not much. Adapt, transform, or fail. And I think we're trying to avoid the latter. 
So the best concept that I can get for resilience is this idea of a rubber band. So it's got that sort of stretchy elasticity. So let's tease that apart for a bit. So it's not the concept of rebound or robustness, even though that's its entomology, that's its history. Um, it doesn't add much to our understanding if this is how we use the term. What it really is, it's a difference from this. This gets to that fracture idea in the stress-strain plot. It's the contrast to brittleness. And brittleness is when things, uh, uh, in, in the nuclear power industry, they call it going solid, when they sort of lose their awareness and sense of what's happening. And that can sometimes happen on a very busy shift. And you uh, misplace patients. Uh, there are brittle interactions with crowding and cross-scale issues like the ICU is full, so you've got extra patients in the emergency department. All those things play into this, this concept of brittleness. But the other idea is the positive side of it, and this actually comes from biology. So control architecture in biological systems. So this concept of graceful degradation, so you don't just fall off the edge, you actually extend it out. And extensibility, so those two things go back and forth together. All right, so how is this going to apply to us? So this is where the new version of safety comes. The traditional version of safety is the avoid what goes bad. So you, it's a protection model. So this idea is that a system is safe and resilient and can adapt to sustain operations under expected and unexpected conditions. And applied to healthcare, it looks somewhat like this. The ability of the healthcare system to adjust functioning prior during or following events, those can be all kinds of things, and thereby sustain operations under expected and unexpected conditions. So this is why it's important. And we've had our own very real lesson of this not so long ago. And uh, this was actually written up in that, uh, the first chapter of this book, um, of how this department coped with the Stanley Cup riot. And there are three or four key elements to the Stanley Cup riot at St. Paul's. One, we'd had one before, so we'd had some experience. Uh, we had prepared for the 2010 Olympics the year prior, so there's all this regional preparation. So the, the Code Orange plan was uh, well rehearsed by a lot of people. Um, people were listening to the radio and the television and seeing what was happening as it happened and were able to respond. And that, in my mind, is the most remarkable part about it. The response of the hospital went well beyond the Code Orange uh, because people just showed up to help. Uh, what we were lucky with is that the patients who presented were uh, injured and didn't have to stay in hospital. So the department is actually back to relatively normal function within about five or six hours. So it's a, it's a beautiful example that it, 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 uh, gives all these principles. Two key things about resilience. It's not, it's a noun, but it's, a, it's an emergent thing. So it's like lightning. It's like tornadoes. It's something that comes out of the interactions of a system. So in that way, it's hard to measure. That's the, one of the challenges uh, the theorists have with this. Uh, and it's fundamentally about surprise. It's about the ability to adapt and cope with surprise. So it's this emergent phenomenon that copes with surprise. So that was, that's the key feature of it. So these are the four uh, potentials or capabilities that I talked about with the standard very briefly. And so what we have done is take a generic tool that uh, the theorists have put together and adapt it to our context. And I'm going to walk you through that because that's what we've done for the last year and a bit. So the purpose was to adapt, then to pilot and evaluate what's known as the Resilience Analysis Grid, which unfortunately is acronymed as the RAG. So these are the, the, the sort of the overarching questions that we approached. Uh, and under each of these questions is a bunch of sub-questions that are uh, cross-industry questions. So they're not unique to uh, healthcare. And so the purpose of all of this was to adapt them to healthcare. So, First question is, how ready and able are we to respond when something unexpected happens? Second, how well do we detect changes to work conditions that affect our ability to perform? How well do we learn from what happens and what effort do we put into what might happen into the future? So we spent uh, a world cafe style, so this was the, the method, 20-minute uh, cafe rounds. If those aren't familiar with the style, it's uh, basically a group of people getting into a room, sitting around a table, 
they can write what their thoughts are onto the tabletop, and then every 20 minutes they get up and move tables. One person stays as the host, and then you get this, what I, they call cross-pollination of concepts and ideas, and then collectively we sat and discussed them at the end. And uh, I would argue that it wasn't so much the product that was powerful, but the conversations and getting together and talking about this was powerful. So this is what we came up with. This, we had a graphic artist on our last day, and we're not going to walk through this. I'll tease it apart in a minute. Um, but this was the concepts that we had actually discussed. So what we came up with, and we've been working at this for the last year to get the words down so everybody understood what we were talking about. We have a list of 24 statements, six for each potential. Uh, that's uh, parsed down from about 37 statements. So we tried to get rid of redundancies and, and things that we're duplicating and get to words that everyone could understand. Some of it is informed by the literature, uh, and some of it is adapted specifically. So I'm not going to go through the uh, questions uh, one by one. We can do that if you want afterwards. But I'm just going to show you what we've done with it. So that was the uh, questions about the ability to respond, the ability to monitor. This one actually generated a lot of discussion. And so we uh, used an online survey tool to get the sense of the department uh, and graphed it out in a sort of star plot graph. And you can see, uh, and the purpose behind all of this is to sort of give a strategic framework and show things that we're doing well or not doing well that we think are important for resilience. So you can see there that the, the quote, vital signs aren't performing very well. So the question was, we. Um, uh, graphically display critical real-time operational performance indicators. Just like we look at vital signs for patients, you can actually have system vital signs, and we're just going to go through that in a second. Uh, so we had hoped to be able to put this on each computer so everyone could see it from wherever they were working in the department. But unfortunately, our IT system is uh, brittle, as is the ability to program it. And that's because it's out of date, and it's not being supported, and we don't know when the next one is coming. Uh, so we've gone to a pen and paper version, but now it's printing out every hour. So at the back desk in the department, this prints out on the hour, and the charge nurses are putting it up on a clipboard, and the idea is to actually pay attention to what these metrics are telling us. So this suite of metrics was selected by everyone in the department, those who participated. There was a board outside the trauma room as well as online, as the things that we look to to get a sense of how the department's functioning. So what we have here is the total number of patients, which the literature shows is as good as any model for a metric of crowding. The number of patients waiting to be seen, that's a concept of incoming work. The number of patients in the RAS or waiting room, that's a measure of access block. Uh, the number of CTAS2 patients in an unmonitored space, well, the sine qua non of an emergency department is to respond to these patients. So that's a, a metric of acute resource matching. And then, again, we talked about this earlier, but the mean ED length of stay as a metric of work in progress. And so these are all uh, tied to the literature and system dynamics. And that's why uh, they actually make sense, but they also make sense to practitioners. And that's the beauty of this. So we've been using this. The question now is, what difference has it made? And I don't have an answer for that yet. So we're going to see. But here's a, I presented this in Denmark just a, a few weeks ago. And this is the slide I used from a day in July, just an average summer day. And if we use the Gutman uh, threshold of even six hours, that was the top of their list, or the, the highest hour there, uh, and draw the line, you can see where our mean ED length of stay spends a lot of its time in the department at risk. So I'm not saying patients are having bad outcomes, but they're at risk for having bad outcomes based on this association. So, the, the, um, so zero is midnight. There is no 25, I know. That's just how it came out. Uh, I didn't have time to change it. But usually a department recovers overnight. And that's one of the advantages of having a diurnal variation over a day. If the department can't recover overnight, then it's blocked up in the early morning, and then you know you're going to be in trouble over the day. So the whole point of this is to try to get some signals that people can be more anticipatory to or proactive as opposed to reacting. Uh, so on nights like this, the bed meeting has to happen like at 5 a.m., not 7 or 9 a.m. 
so that they can get the, the process moving. But if you're not monitoring it, you can't tell. Um, and that gets to this idea. Again, back to that stress strain idea. So when you're in that plastic region when things are degraded, performance is degraded, you have to have strategies to be able to adapt and or transform. So that's what those two other uh, stretches of the graph are about. But this is where we, we bogged down. We were trying to define what the thresholds were that should change what we do. And we couldn't all agree on that. So that's still work to be done. Um, but what do you do differently when you reach a threshold? What can the organization do differently to help us when we reach a threshold? So the whole concept here is to create signals that the organization and or the system can see so that they can instead uh, pull patients when necessary as opposed to us pushing patients to where they need to go. That's the point. Um, the two other domains are the, uh, the, the learning domain and then the anticipatory domain. And so uh, this is probably the one that we felt perhaps the most comfortable with. Um, this is the one we haven't spent a lot of time talking about. Um, but you can see we just kind of group around the middle uh, for all of them. But I picked up on this one, uh, the statement number 21, to invest in developing and maintaining capability to understand and predict threats to safety, quality, and performance. And we have... Uh, the point of that is to create foresight. It's not the same as looking backwards, and you can't drive a car just looking in the rearview mirror. Um, partner with the folks in the operations division at Sauter. So this is happening as we speak. Uh, five years of regional data, um, the big data predictive analytics idea. Uh, thankfully, there are some models out there that we can uh, start with, but the problem is um, a lot of them are not stochastic enough, if you will. And so the point of that is that you need to allow for the nonlinearity piece. And so that's the part we're going to struggle with. But um, hopefully sometime, maybe before Christmas, but probably in the new year, we will have uh, the beginnings of a model that hopefully will allow us to predict operational demand. And with, at least within a several hours of forecasting, and the point of all that is to then be able to allow us to adjust our functioning. So hopefully that's what's coming out of this. So that's a tour of uh, the concept of engineering resilience in an urban emergency department. But I'm constantly reminding of, reminded of this. Uh, good old Machiavelli. There's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in success than to take the lead on the introduction of a new order. That is what we're trying to do. We're trying to change the perspective on safety and from avoiding what goes wrong to promoting what goes right. Uh, and that's the safety two concept, and resilience is a central feature of that. So we really are on a journey. I don't know where this is going to take us. That's the beauty of exploration and science. Uh, but I am hopeful, based on what I know, that it's going to lead to something productive and hopefully uh, uh, helpful for patients. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, and invite questions. But before I do, I might also tell you that there is a group of international scholars who are coming to us next year. I'm the host. Uh, this is the sixth meeting of scholars around the world looking at applying these concepts of resilience into healthcare. And uh, so they'll be with us next August. So hopefully, some good things will come out of that. But let's go back to uh, questions and or comments, and or critiques, and or feedback. All of, the, all of the above is good. Let's start with the folks that are online. Anybody online would like to, uh, let me see. No, nope, they're not muted. OK, in the audience. Good, good idea. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, um, this is, as we said at the start, not easy work. It's not easy work. And it requires us all to be engaged. Indeed and it I, does. I think that um, you know, my hat's off to you for engaging at least the department at St. Paul's. I know even that has sometimes a struggle in our busy lives to sort of see where this is going. Um, are there other emergency departments that are doing this kind of thing? I know you have collaborators. 
is there anybody that's that's sort of at a similar place or a little bit past where you are or a little bit shorter where you are that's doing this kind of simple, similar work or is this really really on the, on the cutting edge? Uh, so work has been done with this tool in other industries. So French Rail, Nuclear Power in Australia, uh, offshore oil. We are the very first in healthcare. Uh, and we are the only people working in the emergency department. So there's a group in Sweden who's working on a pediatric ward. Uh, there is a group in uh, London, uh, England, who are just about to start, and they're working on a medical surgical inpatient ward. And uh, there's a group in Australia that has expressed interest, but they haven't begun yet. So I'm not sure where they're going to put their focus on, but probably critical care ICU because that's the people who are involved. So we're the only emergency department that I know of. Um, has there been any thought to the fact that the emergency department is only one portion of moving people through the system? You, all these departments are BC ambulance and the rest of the hospital and you push patients through. And also, how do you get them home? After. Absolutely. So uh, the emergency department is kind of the hub of the system because uh, it's the interface between community and acute. But uh, you're absolutely right. There are uh, levels within the system that impact what we do that uh, we will need to partner with going forward. So uh, the purpose for simply keeping it within the, uh, the boundary, if you will, even though it's a porous one, of the emergency department is to just start a foothold to get the concept rolling, see how we tackle it. I mean, if we can tackle it, make sense of it, then I think we can translate it to other places for sure. Jim. Um, yeah, maybe you can mention that there's been people at, at other levels in the administration who are supportive. Indeed. It's not just sure. So in the, in the World Cafes, we had... Uh, patients. We had uh, clinicians within the department. We had hospital leaders. Uh, we even had invited guests from, uh, from the UK who happened to be in town for a day, and they were um, quality improvement people. So they participated as well. So it was a whole, and purposely done so, it was a, a mixture of perspectives. And I think that was really the power of it, is that we had people who don't talk to each other sitting in a room talking to each other. Uh, coming up with the concepts or struggling with the concepts is maybe the better way to say it. And how does it actually apply in everyday work? In one sense, re emergency departments are innately resilient. It's kind of what we do. But there's also a whole part of our, our workspace that is brittle. And this is a way to try to identify and anticipate and find other state spaces, if you will, uh, that we can go to so that we can keep going. Because I don't see us as contracting. I see the numbers as getting increasingly higher and more complex, and we are going to have to find ways to manage that. Jim. Um, when I think about this, I, uh, I think about certain times in my practice where there would have been uh, potentially a different outcome. About a patient that we kind of not all that long ago, M and M rounds arrived very sick and shocked, and it was difficult to discern just what was going on. But our uh, resuscitation two beds and resuscitation room were uh, full, and um, the patients weren't really all that critically ill in there because the whole department was sick. Mm -hmm. And so, as that patient arrived, because we hadn't been able to prepare, we had to go to a bed way at the back. And we didn't have the right resources. She continued to deteriorate. I had to talk to the other docs who were taking care of the other patients and say, look, I've got somebody sick who needs to be in the recess room and, um, and try to get approval for that and get those patients out and move them around. And it really took the focus off the patient and, um, and what we needed to do. And, and so am I right in kind of thinking that a goal of this would be that we would um, – we, we would be anticipating that some event like that was going to happen, and we would know in advance that if that happens, uh, we are not ready right now. And if a 
potentially that's a bad outcome. So to be really focused and practical, with yep. we need that recess. We need one recess get open all the time. If it's not open, we have to find ways to open it as quickly as we can because we don't know when. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the one of the uh, uh, key concepts in the idea of resilience is a word called slack. Uh, and slack. Well, any of you fishermen? There you go. So do you ever have a tight line in the water? Never. The fish won't go for it. So you have to have some slack and give, so the fish has something to take and run with, so you're able to hold on to it. So there's there, there's way more to the word than that, but some people see it as inefficiencies, but having a trauma uh, or a sus space available or just a space available, so there's a concept other, in other areas of healthcare called the bed ahead. So you always have a bed ahead. You, so there's always a space for someone to go. Uh, and it's not a waiting room chair. It is a bed that they can go into. Now, not everyone needs a stretcher. I get that. But at least they have a space where they can be assessed and, and worked on. The RAS has played a big part in giving us that flexibility. But we are really getting close to exhausting that resource. It's getting uh, very difficult, I would say. Um, but yes, it, it is the right idea. Building slack into the system so that you have the ability. So the other terminology that's used is the capacity for maneuver. It, it, those two nuances get there. But if you don't have space to maneuver, and that's when systems become brittle. They have no ability to adjust. So there has to be flexibility built in. Keep going. Um, yeah, so, so what we've done traditionally in the past has been to say, look, we're overcrowded. We need to build bigger emergency departments. Sure. Which this is actually saying, no, you, you really don't need to build bigger emergency departments because sometimes we're OK. And um, we need to know when we're getting into trouble, and then we have to change some of the processes, and then we actually can handle what is about to come in the door. And, and I think, you know, that to me, that should be something that ministry and health authorities really pay a lot of attention to, yes. because what they don't want is for us to just be building bigger and bigger and bigger emergency departments. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think um, I don't think I'm going to be putting myself too far out on a limb. I think if uh, we thought of our ideal workspace, we would come into a department that has places for patients and we would go see them in those places and life would carry on just fine. Where we struggle is the issue of access block and so we, have, we don't have spaces. And so we are adapting to make spaces, um, but if the system was functioning, as in pulling patients to where they need to go, then that would create the flexibility within our own workspace. So. Uh, I think that's where the, and there's been lots of effort to try to make that happen, but it is in many ways, emergency department crowding is a wicked problem. It doesn't lend itself to easy solutions. And um, so, but it, it gets back to the earlier comment that it's not just within the department, it's the interactions with the, the, between the department, what's coming in and what's uh, going out. But yes, especially if we have a smaller department in the new hospital, boy, is this ever going to be more important. But what I'm kind of half hoping, uh, well, not half hoping, I'm really hoping, is uh, that this predictive analytics tool that we're going to generate from five years of data is going to give us some information about the demand that we can anticipate. And that will allow us to make more sensible decisions. Uh, if it is, hasn't been clear, let me just make perfectly clear, what I'm trying to do is Make good use of the data that we all collect uh, as part of the operations of the department, but to use it in a way to make good sense of the operations so that we can be strategic in our adaptation, as opposed to just making it up ad hoc, sort of at a first order level of problem solving, but sort of taking it at a higher picture level. And And... You know, it, it is, it's an interesting question to say, well, yeah, everybody knows this, right? You know, why aren't they doing this stuff? What's the difference? What's this going to make? But as in, in much of science, once you quantify it and articulate it better, um, it, it does help to change processes, whether it's related to patient care or whatever it is. And so it, it, my hope is that it takes us from the management of our hospitals and the whole problem overall in our systems 
because it might be regional solutions, it could be ambulance solutions, it could be local hospital solutions, right? That um, instead of the the response being, oh man, that's a difficult problem. Why are those guys whining again? Mm -hmm. To being able to say, no, here's where we are. Yeah, there's a high likelihood that this is going to happen. And if this happens, the concept of patient outcomes is this. And so you, if you don't respond to help us and, and work, we all work together to respond to this, then we are part of the problem. And if they can see that connection clearly with some quantification, yep. then, then um, I think the argument is strong. I hope the argument is strong. Yeah, I think the, the point is to use the, the data to help tell the story to facilitate the argument for not just us warning flags when we're in trouble, but actually seeing ahead of that when we're about to get into trouble so that the conversations happen earlier in the process. It's, it's all about the lag effect. If you try to solve a problem well into the problem, then you may already be too late. But if you can attack it early on, then you may have a chance to change the outcome. So those of you who are residents or learners, what do you see in your future as to how you're going to cope with uh, the operations of an emergency department? Because uh, maybe you've already started to get a sense of this, but emergency clinicians have two jobs, and they're always balancing the two. There's the clinical job, and there's the operational job. And it's not just guys like Julian who are doing the operations. It's all of us as we work doing operations. So I'm just curious uh, what you've seen, what you've witnessed, what your uh, worries are going forward, and how the healthcare system is going to help you do your work or hinder you doing your work. Anyone want to tackle that one? No. Yeah. Hi from VGH. Thanks for uh, thanks for a great talk again. It's hard for a, a resident in the, just learning the first job, the clinical stuff, to make a comment on the second. Uh, but the thing I wonder about is that struggle. We're always taught to to focus on the one patient in front of us, and uh, to, to to make treatment decisions that are the best for that patient. And then you also see a huge variety of practice in how far uh, different staff work up different patients. And it's something I'm still learning the clinical side, so I'm not able to make a definitive comment on workflow and that kind of thing. But, but you know, I, I, may, I wonder about, like, should I be working this person up more? Should I be going that extra step and advocating, or should I be kicking them out the door so that we can free up beds and time so I can see more people? And as a learner, I think that's something that's hard to, to really understand. I'm just going to focus on the, the best clinical stuff I can and then find out what to do when the dust settles on the other side of residency. <laughs> well, that's an excellent comment, and I, uh, I appreciate that, yes, your focus absolutely has to be on learning the clinical, but I will challenge you with the concept of you only treat the patient in front of you. I think we have a unique job in healthcare in that we're treating a population of patients, and that is one of the ethical and, I would even argue, moral dilemmas that we face all of the time is to how much effort do we put into the patient directly in front of us recognizing that there are other patients we need to attend to. So it gets into this concept of distributive justice. And uh, that lives out in everyday work in what we do. Uh, how do we apportion what are limited resources to the care of a population of patients? And I'm not even talking about the population of patients out in the community. I'm talking about the population of patients within the department. Um, because they're all, there's always a contest for your attention. And you have to decide how to manage that. And that's one of the key skills of functioning as an emergency clinician. One of the things which I've always found interesting is uh, that you spent three or five years or in the States four years learning the clinical aspect of things. And there's tons of lectures on amantia poisoning and all sorts of things that are really not that common. But when it comes to actually running an emergency when you're a staff on your first day and you decide like you said who do you who do you send home who do you send home with follow-up which service do you consult to what's the slickest way to get tests every time they, there's no lectures on this ever 
there's uh, you just sort of learn by osmosis and you get a huge range of responses. So Garth, this is obviously an important thing and maybe the residents want to comment. Should this be part of the medical education curriculum that somebody says, here's how to actually like, you know, you look at someone who's really slick, like uh, I mean, Sajin or Sunil Mangal, who can just run a department. How do you learn how to do it? And uh, it, it's not particularly easy. You can watch them. Or, or Bin Lim, some guy who just effortlessly mows through the department. Nobody's getting worked up. Nobody's staying a minute longer than they have to. They plow through 35 patients safely every day. How do you do that? And that is a skill that is very, very difficult to teach. Some people get it instinctively. Other people never do. But it's never been part of any medical education. And I think because we've pilfered a little bit from cardiology, from ophthalmology, from general surgery, uh, we've learned training techniques from them. But this is really our unique skill is being able to stick handle patients efficiently through the department. There's lots of patients when you're closing up Mount St. Joe's at night, at eight o'clock at night, I, I can't afford to do a ton of tests on you. You might need to come back in the morning. Is that great uh, clinical advice? Is that stuff you should be doing on an exam? No, but that's kind of how the real world works. I can't keep the nurses there till midnight to work up somebody's incredibly low risk stuff. They can come back in the morning for an ultrasound, but that's never ever taught. Any comments from the residents? Well, I'm going to make a comment quickly. So what you've just described is what's uh, described in the literature as the efficiency thoroughness trade-off. And there's always a trade-off. Uh, and it's a balance of that issue of how, how deep do I dive, knowing that I have to uh, surface again to see another patient. Uh, and recognizing that we're not individual players. We are uh, players on a team, we have, uh, we're going to play the puck to where it's going to, or skate to where the puck is going is the whole idea. Um, but that we don't carry this alone. We are, I've always said that I cannot do my job by myself. I don't think it's physically, cognitively possible to do an emergency physician job by yourself. By definition, especially in an urban department, it is a collective and it is that sense of the collective and the interdependencies between people within the department is where it happens. Um, and so relationships and how to manage relationships is a huge piece of this. Um, but yeah, it, it gets to that, I, that balancing idea. And how do you, how do you actually uh, walk that path? It's not, it's not easy. And you're right, it's not taught. And I know there's discussion in, re in residency about residency resilience, so personal resilience to sustain yourself, but never system resilience. So we're, this is talking about systems. Yeah. I, I think going back to that, I, as a resident, um, I think sometimes, I mean, we don't really get a lot of like formal teaching on, on that operational stuff, like really any, um, but I think a lot of those calculations when they're being made by staff um, are kind of happening in their head and aren't always shared with us. So I think some of the stuff like, well, this is, you know, why didn't we work this up more? Why did we do this instead of that? I think sometimes when those things are coming into the, you know, as a staff physician, you know, how busy the department is and stuff like that, we're not necessarily um, told that, that piece of it. Yes. I, I think that the teaching for us is very clinically focused as well, like the informal teaching on shifts. And so sometimes when those things are coming into play, I, I don't think, that they're necessarily shared. And sometimes I wonder, like, I wonder if maybe we're ordering or not ordering because of these other kind of extrinsic factors, but I, I don't know if we're always kind of told that that's, I, I don't know if that's true or not. No, I, I, I don't doubt that. I think uh, the curriculum is uh, by necessity, very clinically focused, but in, um, oh, I guess maybe it's the last provincial gan rounds I gave with Glenn Regeer. That was one of the arguments we were making is that to be a, a successful practitioner in practice, you need not just competency, but you need capability. You need to have the capability to adapt to surprise and respond to surprise. And um, that is part of the hidden curriculum. Because a lot of the skill set that uh, expert clinicians or experienced clinicians have is in that tacit range. And a lot of it isn't even known to them. And there is the struggle in the swampy lowlands, the messy details of everyday work, and that's why it's so variable when you see people doing their work. But I think that would be a fabulous uh, uh, thing to, 
start describing, like, how do people manage this so that we can pass it on? You know, we've kind of lost, uh, with the way that residency training has gone, we've lost that mentorship piece because we see residents for a very short period of time, and then they're on to another. So that sort of longitudinal mentorship maybe is uh, part of what could help this, but it's just an idea. In the back. Oh, is it working? Um, just talking about... Uh... Uh, from a different learner perspective. I'm a learner in Ottawa here for a year. Um, we've actually incorporated administration in a longitudinal block. So talking about, you have to understand the system you're working in to improve your flow. Right. So both from a large Canada-wide perspective, but even within the hospital and how to improve your flow are topics that we cover. So it is possible to introduce in the system. And I think it is really important because we're not individual players. So yeah. to be kind of a well-rounded clinician and when you graduate. So it is starting to be recognized and incorporated in different programs and very successfully. So. Excellent. Jim. Great discussion. Good engagement. Um, so Garth, when, when we sort of articulated before, when we're trying to anticipate what will go wrong and put into play some of the solutions that prevent us from getting brittle. Mm -hmm. the right words. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I think in general, we think of what the hospital and the inpatient facility has to do, um, what uh, the region might have to do differently, what the ambulance might have to do differently. But as part of that, what we as individual clinicians in the department might have to do differently. So if we've got lots of space and patients aren't overwhelming us at the time, you have, um, I, I guess I maybe say, the luxury of talking to a patient for longer, and um, and if it's an interesting problem, then you you might want to enjoy that interaction and helping the patient from a large uh, a larger perspective. But if that is a problem that um, is is not going to be changed by that interaction today, and that can be managed tomorrow, sort of as Frank says, in whatever way, go back to the GP or whatever. When we get to a certain point, we might have to change how we practice and say to that patient very quickly, I can't really tell you what's wrong with you. I can tell you that I'm not worried that something's going to happen to you today. I think this can be managed tomorrow. See you later. I got to see the next patient because and, and try to facilitate that flow. And it could also be relevant to our teaching. So there might be times when you can really get into depth with a resident or a student about some particular case, but that might be heretical for the head of a university to say this, <laughs> but it, it might be inappropriate to spend a lot of time teaching when your department is going to the dogs. So, so the solutions are partly, we have to own some of them. Is that, is that reasonable? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think we can expect somebody else to fix our house. Um, I think uh, it's our space and we need to, find ways to manage it effectively, and no question that that depends upon relationships with others outside of the space. Um, but it comes back to that balancing piece. Given the demand and the resources, how do you match them in the context and time frame that you have? And it, in some ways, is like an accordion. It can expand and contract, but it has to have that flexibility, that adaptive capacity to do so depending on the circumstances. Um, so yes, I would argue that teaching in a really busy shift takes on a different tone. So you don't dissect down the individual case, but maybe that's the time that you talk about the operational management piece, right? How do we manage all these patients? How do we get to these patients? And so you just, maybe you just shift the conversation and maybe that's how we start dispensing this tacit ideas that we are struggling with ourselves. And I, I think that's the, maybe the key message is this is, not a, this is not a recipe that you just plug in and go for. This is an ongoing thing. And the resilience analysis grid that we've worked on is but the first iteration. The whole point of it is, is to monitor over time and to see the evolution of the department as it struggles with these concepts uh, and populates things. So the Vital signs is kind of up and running. It's not the form that we anticipated we wanted, 
but it is there in a form, but is it actually doing something? And so that's the work we're going to have to keep going. And yes, thank you for making the sense that this is not something I'm doing. <laughs> this is something we have to do. We the department, we the system. Rob. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that one. Right. Uh, no, so that's a really good question. So this is actually the distinction between the folks in the disaster management literature and the folks in the resilience engineering literature. Uh, the folks in disaster management talk about resilience only in response to disaster. So that is where resilience performance comes, is when you're responding to the unthought of. This is the Fukushima, the unthought of thing. Um, and that's when you see it. Well, absolutely, it's there. The resilience engineering people say, well, it's not just there that you see it. You see it in everyday work. And the point is to facilitate more capability in that way, so that more potential for resilience. So is it going to be like the magic 100%? No. Is there a number we can put on it? I don't think there's a number you can put on it uh, because it's an emergent phenomenon. So it's something that is a, it's there and it's not there. And it comes and it goes, depending on what's going on within the context. So um, I think it would be a mistake to think of this as uh, it's something we can just plug and play because it doesn't work like that. Um, but enhancing our capability to be adaptive and being able to respond to surprise is something I think we would all agree that that's a good thing. Um, one of the advantages of the riot, if I can just get back to that, was the Olympics. I do not think we would have had the same outcome if we had not just hosted the Olympics. What the Olympics offered us was, in a time of no stress, to practice responding to stress. And part of resilience is stress. You can't have resilience if you don't have stress. So it's this experience of stress and finding ways to cope with it, coping with complexity is another key phrase, uh, that allows you to build in the capability or the potential for resilient performance. So. There is an element where what we do every day is that, but there's also some things that maybe we should do a better job of practicing for. And so the simulation program is a key piece to that. Um, so we're practicing on running ECMO. That's an excellent thing. And, but we should also practice on the things we don't see very often or would be unanticipated to be part of our everyday work, like pediatric resuscitations, and that kind of thing. So that's kind of how I see that concept. Does that make sense to you? OK. I'll stop there, because time is gone, I think. Sir, thank you very much for making us think. Thank you. We, we, uh, one of our problems is we're not stressed. You look around the world, and the disasters that are happening all the time in other countries, they're getting stressed quite frequently. They should be better at this than us. We have to. Uh, we're being stressed every day, but not in that sort of major calamity disaster kind of way, um, as you've described. So thank you very much. You've made us think. And, My pleasure. Uh, the work is fantastic, and we hope it goes on. And look forward to hearing I hope it goes on, too. All right.